All right, so let's, let's dive in because there's a lot of ground. I'm just going to go ahead and start talking because I'm already behind. Emmaus to New Jerusalem, week 12. Session two, New Jerusalem. At some point, if your thing is called Emmaus to New Jerusalem, you ought to get to New Jerusalem. What do you think? So let's get there. Principle number one. New Jerusalem has imagery that is both present and future. Like those in Christ, it is new creation. New Jerusalem, I'm arguing and contending and saying that the scriptures say, it is both present and future. So let's look. In Hebrews chapter 12, love the book of Hebrews. Um, By the way, I'm going to do a whole... Uh, I get called on to teach the Emmaus Road um, in a two-day session in the summer at Global. I do this at at, uh, at Global Awakening. You have to <laughs> forty-eight hours. Um, I actually get about I get about uh, eight hours of teaching. I have to have the whole thing done in eight hours. So what I'm going to do this time, and uh, you guys pray with me about this because this will be fun. I'm just going to take Hebrews chapter 11 and preach Hebrews chapter 11 and do the whole class from Hebrews chapter 11 because the whole thing is right there. And um, you see, the whole problem with the Hebrews was their unbelief. And Hebrews 11 is calling them into faith. Again, away from Torah and into faith. But we come here to Hebrews 12. For you, Hebrew believers, have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness upon gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given, quote, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the 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 sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. All right, this is taking us back. In fact, honestly, this the writer of Hebrews is grabbing a whole people and he's taking them into a corporate memory of Sinai. And listen, he's intentionally taking them into their trauma. This is inner healing for Hebrews. He's literally taking them right to the point of their pain. And and he's about to contrast Sinai to which they came and shrunk back and Zion to which they have come. And he's telling them not to shrink back. But you have come to Mount Zion. So you didn't come to Sinai, but you've come to Mount Zion. And listen to this. Listen to this. This is so powerful. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable, uh, to innumerable angels in festal gathering. By the way, that's the council, heavenly council. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous ones made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Remember when uh, Moses sprinkled the blood of the covenant on them? This is the blood of the covenant. Well, he combines that image with the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Remember the blood of Abel crying out to God? What, What does the blood of Abel mean, crying out to me? No, he speaks of the, the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word. Um... Five bleeding wounds he bore, received at Calvary. Five bleeding wounds. They plead for me. Forgive him. Oh, forgive, they cry. Let not that wounded sinner die. I might misquote it a bit, but it's the old poem that captures this idea. The blood of Christ crying out for mercy. So to the Hebrews, he says, you have already come to Mount Zion. In the Bible, Zion becomes not only a place, but an idea. One of these days, I'm going to have to preach on the 
the Arche or the image of Zion. The city of the living God. This is over and over the image, the city of God. Your church was named because of this idea of an image, of a city, of, of a heavenly city. New Life City is named because we want to be the city that Abraham was looking for. With foundations whose builder and maker is God. The city set on a hill. The city, which is the, the city of the living God. The New Jerusalem. A city that is called New Heavenly and from above. Now, all these other things. He says, you've already come to these, but I stop here. You've already come to New Jerusalem. you already come to the heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem. I'll say it the way it says it there. Uh, you can put your, where it says new, you can just write in heavenly. But it's called new in one place, heavenly in one place, and from above in another place. In uh, um, uh, Revelation, it's called new. Here, it's called heavenly. And in um, Galatians, it's called the Jerusalem from above. All right. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Now, again, again, can I just, this, uh, let's do an inner healing thing. He, he has them all and he says, let's go, to, let's go to Sinai. What do you hear? Oh, no, no. We, we hear that voice that made us want to run for our lives. He says, what do you hear now? See that you don't refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more will I shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. By the way, I also believe that was a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in the context. We often spiritualize it. I often spiritualize it myself. We go on. Principle two. So you got it? So he's talking to them about New Jerusalem. Here's what that piece did for me. It fixed it in my mind that when the Hebrews came to Jesus Christ, they came here and now, or there and then, if you will, to, new, to the heavenly Jerusalem, meaning they already had it. It was not yet, and yet it was here. You have already come. So he's, he's saying to them, don't, don't leave what you've come to. So from beginning to end, the covenant is about receiving what is given. Blessing requires receiving. That is, if you're going to have a blessing, you have to receive it. Hebrews 12, 27. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is the things that have been made. In order that the thing that cannot be shaken may remain. So what was going to be removed? The temple. The Levitical priesthood. Even their genealogies. That the thing that cannot be shaken might remain. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Once again I'll tell you. The book of Hebrews was written about 68 A.D. Before the shaking of heaven and earth. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. So here's what he says to them. The kingdom that you've been part of that you're thinking of going back to is going to be shaken once more. But the kingdom that cannot be shaken is going to remain. And this is why, listen, no matter what happens, there's no circumstance in history that can shake us. Because we are members of an unshakable kingdom. We have inherited a kingdom that cannot be shaken. All right, New Jerusalem. I think... In Revelation chapter 3, see, this is one of the other places. This is the Church of Philadelphia. Where's my friend Nick and all those championships Philadelphia's winning this year? Okay. The one who conquers. Say conquer. Say overcome. 
All right. If your name is Nicholas, Nikki, anything to do with uh, that sound, your name is from the word Nikeo, or if you will, Nike, that the shoe factory is on. And it means you are an overcomer. It means you are a conqueror. You were named to be a conqueror. And if you read through the book of Revelation, and to the one that overcomes, and to the one who overcomes, and to the one who overcomes, the idea is that every one of us, no, no matter where we are, we are designed as overcomers. And the one who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So new Jerusalem is, this is what I'm arguing. This is what I'm going to argue from here on. New Jerusalem is a here and now reality. Already, not yet. So I sometimes say to people, say, what are you doing? I say, Alan, what are you doing? I'll say, walking on streets of gold. <laughs> and then I like, don't you wish you were me? Amen. Right? Where gold is the pavement. I'm not waiting for it. You, you want to... Gal and I are living this life now. And I'm going to tell you what. We have kingdom sightings all the time in our life now. So friends, call me up and say, we need some healing in our family. Can we come to your church? Because we hear there's healing in your church. And they get healing. And we deal with hard issues. And we sit down and deal with hard issues. And I'm telling you, I spent most of my Christian life knowing that every time I'm dealing with a hard issue, I was going to make an enemy. I spend most of my time nowadays when I'm dealing with hard issues expecting to end up with closer friends than I've ever had. Because I'm expecting to win. I'm living to win. I'm living to be a conqueror. I'm not living to be conquered. I'm in it to win it. And I think that these people were people who are being told that if they overcome, if you overcome, it's not talking about what will happen when you die. I'll make him a pillar in the temple of God. Never shall he go out of it. I'll write on him a new name. It's something that you experience now. You have to receive the kingdom. I'm saying receive the kingdom now. Okay, Revelation 12, 7. Because I'm pressed for time, I'm going to leave this little section out. Except I'm going to read 12, 11 because you can't get through Revelation without this verse. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives even unto death. You think that's waiting on the second coming? That's you here now. Who have you overcome? You've overcome the enemy, the accuser. You've overcome the beastly powers of, of this world. How? By the blood of the lamb, the word of your testimony, and because you're willing to die for your faith. You, you, listen, you can't, you can't love not your lives even unto death unless you're alive. It's, a, it's about kingdom being present. Therefore rejoice, O heavens. And you who dwell in them, but woe to you, earth and sea. For the devil has come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. That's always the devil. And now, again, I don't have time to do proper on that, but principle three. New Jerusalem, in the apocalyptic vision of John, reveals the union of heaven and earth over and over. Now let's have some fun. Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had what? And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Yes, that's one of the passages that lit me on fire years ago about this study. 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Here is what I am maintaining right up front. This experience is both present and future. It's both here and coming. New Jerusalem, God has come to dwell. The word dwell means tabernacle. Everything is new. The new has come. Note, note in this text, we haven't gone anywhere. The old has gone and passed away. The new has come and he will, and he will wipe away. Thus there's a future element for the present. So this is saying God's come to dwell. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. But I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven. Meaning to say, we didn't go up, it came down. Hmm. Where heaven and earth meet. In John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that talking about? Who's that talking about? Okay. The word became flesh and did what? Dwelt. This word dwell means to tabernacle, means to set up a habitation among us. This is a temple language. And we have seen his glory as the only begotten of the Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, check this out. Ephesians 1, 9. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. In who? Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth. So I'm back to where I was a while ago. Christ came and dwelt among us. When he came and dwelt among us, heaven and earth met in him. And heaven and earth still meets in him, only he's expanded. Because that other passage we read in Ephesians was about him building us into a dwelling place. John chapter, um, what is it? Chapter 14. In our, my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, you go know in the way you know. That passage is not about a heavenly building program. That passage is about a Jesus who went to the cross and made a place for us with him and is building us into a habitation for God. And New Jerusalem is about us being built into a habitation for God. New Jerusalem is temple theology, is God living in the temple that is his people and filling all in all. And oh my goodness, I can only barely imagine it. So he gives us language for it. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars... Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Of course, that's the terrifying passage. But look what it, but, but so he's talking about those that are within and those that are without. Principle four, the interpretation of complex imagery is often revealed in easy to understand pictures. Here we go. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me and said, come and I will show you what? The bride, the wife of the lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God and having the glory of God It's radiance like the most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. All right. New Jerusalem 
is the bride of Christ. New Jerusalem is not a building to live in. New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. And we know about the bride in Ephesians 5. I get obsessed with this stuff because I've told you before when God called me to the ministry, he took me to Ephesians 5 and he said, this is your only assignment. So I'm doing my assignment tonight. I'm washing the bride with the water of the word so that his bride will be glorious. Glorious. This city is familiar. There's a city coming down out of heaven. Now, this imagery just simply means heaven is the source. What does this mean? This means heaven is coming to earth. This means the imagery of the reunion of heaven and earth. The discontinuity of heaven and earth that came with the fall is being undone by the people of God. So that there's now continuity again. In other words, this is, if you will, you'll see it before we're done, a return to Eden. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. And at all the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the Son of Israel were inscribed. And on the east, three gates. And the north, three gates. And the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. In other words, this whole place is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. This city is made up of God's work in the Old Covenant through the patriarchs and God's work in the New Covenant through the apostles. Never stops. Twelve is the number for God's work in the world. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and the gates and the wall. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod. Twelve thousand stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured the wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. I get a tickle out of that right there. So what lies in the background of this image? The first thing that lies in the background of it is Ezekiel 40 to 48. In other words, I've I've told you before, if you want to understand John, you have to understand Ezekiel, both in his gospel and in his apocalypse. So go meditate on Ezekiel. If you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll read about Ezekiel's temple. If you read about Ezekiel's temple, because we're all such literalists and we've been taught to be literalists, um, it'll, it'll blow our mind. It's meant to blow your mind. And then this is meant to blow your mind. Um, the idea is simply this. The place is big. Uh, In other words, the the work that God's doing is not like a small remnant-like work. The work that God's doing is a massive work, an explosive work, an expansive work, an unbelievable work. Now, all of these, have you noticed all the twelves? Twelve gates, twelve foundations, uh, twelve thousand stadia, 144 cubits, which is twelve by twelve. All this 12, this is, this is simply a way of giving us the inclusive picture of all God's work, of all God's history, through all the covenant. Um, <laughs> if you have a Bible, and I used to make a lot of fun of this, I don't have time to make as much fun of it as I want to. If you have a Bible that, that, that translates stadia and cubits, into miles and, and feet, just tear that page out. Why? Because what you're intended to get in these texts is the imagery, not the 
measurement. The imagery. So by translating the measurement into something else, you end up obscuring the meaning rather than revealing it. The revelation of the meaning is not in the actual size. The revelation of the meaning is in the symbolism implied. All right? Um, one of the things that I like in 1 Kings 6 and 20, we read about the only other cube in Scripture. There's only two cubes in Scripture. If you notice, this is cubes, cube measured. There's, there's, this, is the only, this is only the second one. What's the other one? I didn't hear it. The Holy of Holies. You got to be bold with me. The only other cube in the Bible is the Holy of Holies. Why would this city have be another cube writ large? Because what? Heaven is coming back to earth. The presence of God is coming back to earth. And the entire New Jerusalem is described in the shape of the Holy of Holies and with all other kind of imagery that points to the same thing. Principle number five, entering the city requires passing through a gate of pearl. And the formation of the pearl is suggestive. Let's come to this. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was of pure gold like clear glass. And the foundations of the walls of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, a gate. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, onyx. The sixth, carnelian. The seventh, chrysolite. The, seventh, the eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. I missed it. The eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Okay. Again, all of, this, all of this imagery is meant to draw us to the priesthood and the temple and the ministry of the priesthood and the temple. But then we get this strange thing of all this is about precious stones. Uh, precious stones are formed. Where's my geologist? Precious stones are formed by heat and time. Pre heat, pressure, and time. That's how you get a precious stone. Except for one. Except for one. The pearl is the only precious stone in this list not made by those means. It's made by pain and suffering. Pain and blood and suffering. And so... The way you get in this city is through the pearl of great price. Every entrance of the city is through the pearl. You're only going to get a survey of this stuff. And I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. And is its lamp. And its lamp is the lamb. By its light. Listen to what this says. The nations will walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. <laughs> and they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. But only those written in the lamb's book of life. Well, what's going on here? There's all these things that suggest to me what? This is a here and now experience. Why? Well, the city itself is a temple. And the nations are designed to walk by the light of the temple. What did Jesus send the disciples out to do? He sent them out, equipped only with the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And he sent them out to disciple the nations or to teach the nations to walk in the light of the presence of God. And the kings of the earth bring their, bring their glory into it. That's not going to happen after heaven. This is not a picture of heaven. This is a picture of something that happens in space and time. 
The gates are open. Entry is still possible. Nothing unclean is allowed inside. You have to get cleansed to come in. The act of coming in is the act of being cleansed. Principle number six, the commissioning of the apostles and the functioning of life in the city are one. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. You can see this imagery, by the way, from Eden, and you can also see this imagery in Ezekiel's temple. Ezekiel's temple looms large in this picture. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Don't you see that this thing has to be present for the nations to get healed? I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care how dark it gets. I don't care how much rejection of the gospel there is. You and I exist for the healing of the nations. Our mission is the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And its servants will worship Him. And they will see His face. And His name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. And they will need no night light of lamp or sun For the Lord will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you about these things. For the churches, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. And this is the invitation. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the ones who desire to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which is described in this book. By the way, this is a curse. Why why would the writer of the book put a curse on this book? Because he doesn't want anyone to mess with it in any way. Meaning, the book of Revelation was intended to be read and heard. And that's why in the very beginning of the book, it says, whoever hears these words gets a blessing. If you want want the blessing of the book of Revelation, just play it in your ear and hear it. And oh, by the way, I think this warning at the end of this book is one of the reasons why don't translate something out of the images that it has in the original language. They are symbols intended there to carry a meaning and the writer doesn't want this book messed with. So don't, so don't make the numbers clearer. Leave them in their symbolic form. Principle seven. We end where we began. By the way, just let me just say what I'm saying. I'm saying to you, I want to be crystal clear. New Jerusalem has come, is coming, and will come. And I unapologetically say that I exist for the healing of the nations. I exist for the leaves of the trees to be salve for the nations. I exist to make disciples for Jesus in the here and now. And I exist walking on streets of gold and declaring a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God and calling them to be jealous and long for what my eyes have seen and what I've heard and what I have possessed. Closing, we end where we began. Life in the garden is life in the spirit. The very life of God is our life. Adam began formed a creature having the breath of God breathed into him. The end of the covenant is the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ 
is acceptable to God and approved of by men. The kingdom of God is a kingdom in the Holy Spirit. Here endeth the lesson. Amen.